Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What role can young people play in combating climate change, illiteracy, and poverty? What is one United Nations office doing to inspire and mobilize young people around the world to help achieve these goals? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Young people, the youth, are critical to our future. Obviously, they're going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And today, we're going to be talking about what youth can do to be involved in confronting many of the problems, such as climate change, illiteracy, poverty, and many others. My guest today is someone who has a very unique position at the United Nations. My guest today is Mr. Ahmed Al-Hindawi of Jordan. Mr. Ahmed Al-Hindawi is the first ever United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, assuming this office in February of 2013. Mr. Al-Hindawi previously worked as a youth policy advisor in the League of Arab States in Cairo. Past experience also includes serving as a youth program associate at the Iraq Office of the United Nations Population Fund and as an emergency program officer at the non-governmental organization Save the Children. Ahmed al welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I yeah. appreciate you being with me. Let's start off with why, uh, why did the Secretary General appoint this envoy on youth and why did he select you for this position? Uh, for the first one, I might add. Uh, uh, th again, thank you for this interview. I mean, going back to 2012 when the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, was uh, re-elected for a second term as the head of this organization. He decided that on his five-year agenda in his second term, youth will become one of his top priorities. He made working with and for young people as uh, a top priority for the entire UN system. With that, he announced three key initiatives. The first was, for the first time ever, we have a common work plan for the entire UN system. Here we are talking about more than 40 entities at the UN system coming together and joint strategy and youth issues. This is a huge and this is very important to coordinate and harmonize the UN work and youth issues. Second was um, to allow more young people to come as volunteers at the United Nations. So now UNV, uh, the UN uh, volunteer program, they have a special program for young people starting from 18 years old. The third initiative decided now he wants to bring the UN closer to young people. That's why he decided to appoint an envoy in youth issues, was selected for this position to serve, to bring the UN closer to young people, to harmonize our work in youth issues, and to advocate for a stronger focus in youth agenda. If we look back to the past five years, for example, we have seen how young people took to the streets and made their demands in different places. I personally witnessed uh, the Egyptian revolution first time. I was living in Egypt at that time. And I know the power of young people when they demand uh, more participation, employment opportunities, when they demand to be heard in decision-making processes. I think this is the message that the Secretary General of the United Nations wants to send and wants to make it loud and clear to everyone that our message that it's time to work with before working for young people, you have to partner with young people. I think with, the, with appointing a young, relatively young person for this position, mm -hmm. uh, this sending a clear signal that uh, the UN believes in working with and for young people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, how do, you, do you how do you define youth? Is there a certain age limit or does it vary from situation to situation? But we talk about youth or young people. What are some of the prescriptions we're talking about, for age-wise anyway? Uh, this is one of the most frequent questions I receive about defining youth. Uh, well, youth is, is uh, being defined from a country, to different from a country mm -hmm. to another. But if we go back to the General Assembly of the United Nations and their definition for youth and the World Program of Action for Youth, which was endorsed in 1995 by the member states, uh, they defined youth as 15 to 24 years old. But that was a statistical mm -hmm. definition. 
because this is how we gather data and um, for national youth surveys and uh, different surveys. So that was a purely statistical definition for youth. But we understand very well that um, in many countries they define youth up to 26 or 29 and 30. And that all accepted uh, um, practices at the, at the national level. So if you look to the UN programs and agencies at the national level, we usually interact based on the government and the state definition for youth. Uh, but there's no such a global definition for youth mm -hmm. that is binding for all governments. Uh, it's more a statistical definition in the World Program of Action for Youth. We try, of course, to prioritize the age group 15 to 24 with understanding mm -hmm. that uh, this is not always the case. In many countries, they prefer to work up to 29 or 30, in some cases to, to even more. Mm, exactly. And of course, someone can be much older and be very youthful. So well, uh, <laughs> it's a possibility. Well, that's, that that leads me to the other <laughs> definition of youth, which that's is right. mm, youth is a state of mind and attitude exactly. to life, right? I mean, uh, yeah. in many cases, uh, yeah, uh, being youth is correlated with, uh, with having energy, having uh, being open-minded and to, to uh, uh, not to resist and for change, but to try to, to accept it and to adapt with it. So I think, uh, and, and this meaning for youth, uh, anyone can be, be a young person. We hope so. Yeah. <laughs> That's very <laughs> true. <laughs> Quite true. Well, it, I think it's been estimated there are about 1.8 billion youth out there of the 7.2 billion people right. on planet Earth. What are some of the concrete steps or what types of concrete programs do you have to reach out to the youth to try to bring them in, to get them involved in dealing with these issues that we're dealing with today and they will be dealing with tomorrow in all probability, Absolutely. especially climate change for sure. But how do you, what are some of your specifics that help you to reach out to youth to bring them in? Yeah, and this is, uh, this is a crucial area. I mean, how to listen to young people and how to partner with them because they cannot, you can't work with this uh, large generation of young people. By the way, this is the largest generation of youth in the history. You mentioned 1.8 billion, but if you look to the uh, half of the world's population under 25 years old, so they either children or youth, and this is a huge. So talking about development in general, without looking back to the demographic fact that you have, you are talking about half of the world population under 25 years old, making it an opportunity and a challenge at the same time to, to invest in this generation. For me, my starting point is that we should not fail this generation. We should partner with them. We should allow them with an enabling environment for a healthy youth development. Uh, one of the means to do that is to increase investments in youth issues, increase investments for creating more jobs for young people, more opportunities for them. Now, if we look at the national level, and this is what we call social budgeting, how much from the, social, uh, from the national budget goes to youth or to mm -hmm. fund and sponsor programs that is targeting young people? Unfortunately, this is not uh, the case so far. It's not the majority yet. And it's not a large number or a large percent of the national budget goes to, to programs targeting young people. So this is one of the shifts that we need to make. Looking at the UN system, that's why we have now this word, uh, uh, this common plan uh, strategy for the UN system to work in youth issues in a coordinated manner. So it requires more coordination and it requires also increased investments in young people and youth issues in general. It requires also to, to depart from the way of traditional thinking about thinking that young people, they demand only jobs and they demand only education. Of course, that's true. They want education and good education, and they want decent job opportunities. But they also <coughs> demand to be heard in decision making. Mm -hmm. They demand to be recognized mm -hmm. as citizens. They demand to, for their uh, this generation to be recognized. And here, here I just quote the uh, former president of Brazil, Lula da Silva, who, who, uh, who said, uh, young people, they are not demanding all the uh, jobs and uh, education. They demand to be recognized in the decision making process and for the political institution to be inclusive enough to carry the inputs and the voices of young people around the world. What else we can do to engage them in this development efforts around the world? And you mentioned climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, this plan is not sustainable <coughs> now. And it's only by working with young people will be able to make it more sustainable. By allowing young people to become active voters for, for voting favoring climate change actions or climate actions to, to make this plan more sustainable. And here I quote the Secretary General, he called young people as voters, consumers, and innovators. I think this says it all for me. They are either voters or consumers that they should change the consumption patterns to a way that make this planet more sustainable. And also they should use their power for innovation. The young entrepreneurs who are coming through, they need to be supported so they can bring more innovative solution to the challenges we are facing today. Now, you mentioned climate change, and a lot of people, a lot of foreign policy observers, scientists, politicians, general public, just rank and file people like 
you and I are in the general public feel that climate change is probably the number one crisis that we're dealing with right now. Do you find that in your interactions with young people, do you find that they are more attuned to this problem of climate change, that they're more receptive to looking at it and trying to work up solutions to at least, if not reverse some of the negative impacts of climate change, but at least slow them down or retard them a little bit so mm, that mm. we can try to not have all the ice caps melt and the, the seas rise three or four or five meters or something like that. But are they more receptive to that? Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm working with youth organization and climate change movement. It's called Yango, the climate change movement, uh, the youth climate change movement, who are mobilizing young people around the world. But looking uh, again objectively to the situation of young people, we're talking about more than 1.5 billion around the world who are still living in conflict zones or in fragile states. Mm -hmm. For them, they cannot feel yet the issue of climate change because they are faced with some serious challenges in their daily living. There are other young people who are in conditions and circumstances that would not allow them to think about the climate change as their first issue. Of course it is. It's a serious challenge. That's why the Secretary General is mobilizing the entire UN system, the international community, mm -hmm. to make these two years, uh, a very important two years, to reach a legally binding agreement on climate change by 2015. Going back to young people, look into how the climate change movement is mobilizing actions around the world. Soon, this year, in uh, 2014, in August 2014, we will be having in August 12th, one-day events where hundreds of youth groups around the world are going to mobilize uh, their peers, the young people at the national level, to demand their governments to do more, uh, uh, more bold actions to combat climate change. So we are hosting this year, this year, International Youth Day, by the way, is the August 12th. Mm -hmm. And one day, this huge uh, the global network will be going in different places around the world, in different cities at the villages level, trying to mobilize young people and to make them part of this global movement to make this planet more sustainable and to combat climate change. And this is something my office with UNFCCC uh, will be coordinating this year to ensure that this is a huge global uh, network is coming and working in tandem with the United Nations efforts to combat climate change and to make sure that this mm -hmm. uh, a legally binding agreement should be reached by 2015. And it's not only about negotiations when it comes to climate change, uh, because we can't negotiate with, the, with, the, with the nature. We should negotiate exactly. with ourselves. I mean, this is the what, uh, we should figure it out ourselves and we should make sure that we are ethically and legally reaching this agreement mm -hmm. by 2015. And here's the power of young people, where my job I'm trying to work with this climate change movement to mobilize young people to make sure by 2015 we have a legally binding agreement internationally. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have, and I'm sure we do, have some young people, 18 years old or 20 or whatever, watching the show, and they're saying, now you mentioned some programs, are there other ways they can get more involved with the United Nations? How could someone who says, well, I have an interest in empowering women, or I have an interest mm. in illiteracy, or I have an interest in this, <coughs> what, uh, how can we get more involved with the United Nations? I'm, I'm glad to report that there are many uh, avenues now available for young people to join the United Nations. For example, I mentioned the UNV program, where young people could volunteer now and work with the United Nations. There are also a global <coughs> partnership for youth and post-2015 development agenda. This is an initiative <coughs> we launched with many UN agencies, and it's now available. Young people could Google global partnership for youth and post-2015, and they can become part of this global partnership, which aims <coughs> to set the new development agenda and set out the what are the priorities for young people in the post-2015. Afterwards, we will go on to move together to start looking how young people can play an important role in the implementation. This is a very important global partnership that we are facilitating. I'm inviting all young people who are watching this show as well to apply and become members uh, and show their organization to join this global partnership for youth in post-2015. There are other avenue for participation. For example, the ECOSOC Youth Forum, which allow young people to come here at the United Nations and come to, to understand how the UN works and also to propose ideas for some of the development challenges. Mm -hmm. You know very well about the Model United Nations, which many universities, schools around the world are organizing Model United Nations. It's another way to understand how the UN works as well and how mm -hmm. to, to understand that the UN is not only about the procedures of the intergovernmental negotiations, it's about the principles of human rights, peace, security, development, and uh, this is another opportunity for young people. Uh, but there are so many, and I would say more than hundreds of different programs led by the United Nations, different agencies from ILO, UNDB, UNESCO, all these agencies that are doing amazing work in the ground. <coughs> if uh, uh, all the people are watching, I mean, especially young people who are interested in becoming part of this, 
we have uh, www.un.org slash youth envoy. It's a one-stop shop website where young people could go there, see what's happening around the world, what the UN is offering them when it comes to youth issues and youth programs, and how they can become part of these, uh, these projects. I think this is a very exciting platform for them where they can see how they can contribute to the UN work in youth. And uh, I will not do justice for all the work we do on youth issues, because every time I travel to a country, I'm always surprised with many youth <coughs> events. Yeah. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today, we're taking a look at youth and the role they will play, the role they can play today, and the role they will perhaps play tomorrow in helping to create this better world. And certainly, there is a major role for youth. And my guest today is someone who holds a very unique position at the United Nations. My guest today is Mr. Ahmed. Alindawi of Jordan, who is the first ever United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Ahmed, we're talking about the youth and how they can get involved. And of course, you mentioned your website. They can go to that, to www.un.org.youth and tap into that and uh, learn much more about the programs you're talking about today. Let's uh, focus for a minute on, you've alluded to the Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And of course, we think back to 2000 when the majority of the countries came together and adopted eight logical, practical, measurable goals to, first off, uh, to, rever or to uh, reduce abject poverty by 50 percent, to uh, provide, um, uh, well, universal primary school education, right. to empower women, to reduce infant mortality right. rates and maternal mortality rates, to reverse the AIDS pandemic, to promote right. sustainable development, right. and also to develop global partnerships. And of course, we're talking right. about a lot of those in here. As you deal with the youth, you talked about climate change. Do, do you find that they, are, they have a broad interest in a large number of those goals, or do they like to focus on one, like I uh, say, perhaps, some gr some people would like to focus on empowering women or uh, mm. teen girls like Malala or somebody like ah. that. But uh, do you find that they, they want to really jump into these eight millennium development goals and really try to do something substantive to achieve them? Well, they, they are interested in doing the right thing and uh, to joining development efforts. Sometimes young people not always understand the UN language. They don't always understand, I mean, mm -hmm. there's different development complicated frameworks sometimes for doing the development work. But they like to be part of uh, causes and to support causes. That's why I think uh, it's our job at the end of the day how we communicate these issues. It's our job to make sure that we are explaining what's behind these goals, how these goals are going to touch people's lives. If you look, I mean, uh, to, to the primary education, for example, in Africa, how many young people, I mean, if we compare before 13 years, I mean, at the time of the where the MDGs were set, comparing to now, some significant uh, progress has been made in the, uh, in the continent and thanks to the MDGs and of course to, to, to many other factors for and people and organizations who contributed to this in the ground. So young people, they want to understand the value of these development goals and they want to see how they can become part of implementing these goals. Uh, that's why this global partnership for youth in post 2015 is focusing on two things. The first, helping young people and having a say in what should be in the post 2015 development agenda and bringing these recommendations to member states, where the member states will decide that then uh, what will be the new uh, post-2015 development agenda. The second round is about ensuring that they are playing an active role in the implementation. Because this is not a talk show at the end, what is happening there mm -hmm. at, the, at the national level. Young people, they want to contribute to development work. They want to go to the uh, different villages at the national level, and they want to do and to align their work with the international priorities. That's why I call the new development goals not only a uh, development agenda, I call it development contract. And the reason why it's a called development contract. development contract. I, I like to call it development contract. Yes. Because agenda it sounds like it lags for a bit. Um, but for me, this is very much a development contract. We are all together now in the process of setting the new development contract and after post 2015. Uh, after uh, 2015, after the MDGs comes to an end. Right after that, we should all subscribe to this development contract. Why it's contract? Because it defines rules and responsibilities for everyone. But it defines as well the benefits. If we manage to, to really achieve uh, universal access for all children around the world in the, in the post-2015, in the next 15 years, to eradicate poverty, for example, by uh, 2030. And I think these are all achievable goals. I like what Muhammad Yunus said, that, uh, that we can send poverty to, to the museum. We can make it part of history. At least extreme poverty. 
this is something achievable and we really need to, to believe it's achievable. You know many are talking about social uh, science fiction and uh, when I meet young people I tell them um, I like to talk about social fiction. I believe that there are some issues that we are facing today that could be reversed in 20 years. Yes. One of them is extreme poverty. We have to believe in this. We should believe that we can do this. And this will not be done by governments alone. That's why the mm -hmm. post-2015 is not about governments only. It's not about the private sector only. It's not about big organizations only. It's about everyone. Everyone has a share in this. It's only if we communicate the post-2015 development contract in this language and people understand that this is not about them serving me. It's about me being part of the solution we will be able to achieve a world in the next 15 years mm -hmm. where hopefully it's more prosperous and more, more the development could be enjoyed by everyone. It's not only, uh, I mean, limited or for, for, uh, for uh, certain individuals or certain countries. I think this is the, the aspiration of all member states now. If you look to member states, they are stressing in the value of having the new development agenda as a universal agenda, which relates uh, to, to all citizens around the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that was, that was really the advantage, I think, of developing those eight really quantifiable, measurable goals, as yeah. I mentioned, and putting them into a 15-year continuum from mm -hmm. 2000 to 2015, so that even though there, there's a myriad of issues being dealt with at the United Nations, yeah. uh, from helping to move uh, airplanes in international airspace, ships on the high seas, pr uh, help move mail in the international uh, arena and that type of thing, but also it could focus nations' attention and non-governmental organizations, the private sector, Absolutely. just religious groups, interfaith groups, whatever, they could focus on these eight goals and really try to help to achieve them. As you mentioned, we're moving forward as far as reducing uh, poverty. Yeah. This is one that's actually being achieved in many yeah. areas. Now there's some others like the reduction of infant mortality rates, maternal yeah. mortality rates, which we're not doing quite as well on, but there's been, there's been progress in every mm -hmm. country, I think it's safe to say, but there's still, we're short okay. on a few. But we've got to continue that dialogue beyond December 31st, 2015, and carry it for another 15 years so that we can help eradicate okay. poverty, so that we can really get children into school so that all school children have an opportunity for an education, right. and that's the advantage. Now, there are other items that you, you had mentioned earlier about you were harmonizing within the UN system. There were 40 some agencies, I think you mentioned, or something like that, yeah. that you wanted to bring this message to, and a lot of them, uh, probably every one of them has some program on yeah. youth to some degree. How do you interact with these agencies, and how do you try to help them to maybe talk to one another or, uh, or at least get your ideas into their programs? Uh, I'm glad to say that um, uh, the coordination is happening in the UN in a very systematic way now. We have something uh, called uh, interagency network mm -hmm. on youth development, which basically brings uh, all the heads and the focal points on youth in all different entities. So we have more than 40 entities in the UN system who are coming. All their focal points on youth or heads of youth mm -hmm. program meeting regularly to coordinate our efforts and work in the youth issues. This is not happening only at the international level, by the way. I'm encouraging the establishment of a regional interagency network. So with the interagency network in new development, there are similar networks at the regional level for the UN regional offices. Similarly, we are having at the national level, for example, the UN country team in uh, Sri Lanka, for example. I met uh, a few months ago with the UN country team there, and they have interagency and task force bringing together all different UN agencies who are working in Colombia and Sri Lanka to meet regularly and coordinate their efforts. So the coordination has been enhanced, I mean, uh, the UN system bringing all this uh, commitment from different agencies to do more joint programming. Mm -hmm. uh, so that mechanism is the mechanism that we use to, to make sure that our ambitious plan uh, that we call system-wide action plan you know, mm -hmm. is being translated to, to action at the national level. Uh, I'm so encouraged by this increased coordination and collaboration between the UN agencies and youth issues. I think it comes as uh, understanding from everyone the UN, that uh, youth agenda cannot survive mm -hmm. by being tackled uh, in, in, uh, in one field or the other or uh, only in, in, in one perspective. We should have a more holistic approach to the way we tackle youth issues. Again, the issue of education, employment, participation, mm -hmm. protection against the crimes and violence, all the health issues, uh, all these issues are interrelated and uh, affecting young people's lives. So we need to work together. And this is, this is happening under the leadership of the Secretary General who made this initiative one of his main initiatives in his second term to ensure that the UN is coming together in a more coordinated way. Mm -hmm. Well, in the last minute that we have, 
Do you have, is there some particular lesson, the major lesson we've learned in this time that you've been in this position? Well, my, um, the lesson I learned so far that uh, uh, if you want to, it's something I learned uh, maybe in, uh, from a wise man who once uh, told me if you want to go uh, fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, you have we'll t we have to go together. And then I think that was uh, uh, very true in the case of the international community. Sometimes it takes some time to reach a consensus around issues or to build a joint position. Uh, mm -hmm. but they last once you reach them. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a painful process, I mean, to coordinate and harmonize, uh, but the value is great because once you, we will be able to join forces and really work together. And uh, I'm really hoping this year with the climate change, for example, we'll be able to bring and join forces among the international community to come together in, in a solid way to intervene and to reverse the climate change. Exactly. Well, yeah. Ahmed al yeah. the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, the first ever. I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting thank, thank and you. a very informative program. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.